ready to go rock and roll all right as you see um, this is a statement from dr. Ted Robinson in 40 years of practice as a reconstructed plastic surgeon I have never seen anything like it I doubt if anyone else has either Ted is the guy or one of the major players in the early days of the star child he helped arrange the first DNA test but he is a craniofacial plastic surgeon retired now and he has uh, always been a big supporter of it he knows what it is because of his experience. Next slide. Next slide. There you go. Uh, is that it? No. Okay. okay. The star child was found in Mexico about 1930 by a young girl. She doesn't know how old she was. 10, I mean, uh, 12, 13, 14. 100 miles southwest of Chihuahua, which is there, and that's in the, in the range of the Copper Canyon area. It's high desert area. Next slide. High desert like you would find around um, the Grand... Grand Canyon. Just get a hammer. There you go. Uh, high desert area like you'd find around the Grand Canyon or something like that. And uh, in in a cave, uh, excuse me, in a, in a mine tunnel in the area, in an abandoned mine tunnel, she was out exploring as, as kids will do, and she was uh, had a basket with her, and she found up in the mine tunnel where she could still see lying on the floor of the mine tunnel was a skeleton, a human skeleton lying on its back, 1930. A kid didn't freak out when they saw a skeleton, you know, dogs and things in that area because uh, the bones would stay. So she noticed beside it, when she got a little closer, was a mound of dirt, and coming out of that dirt was what she called a misshapen hand. And that misshapen hand was wrapped around the upper arm bone of the skeleton lying on its back on the dirt. This, that, that one's in the dirt, but the hand's coming out. So she knows something's in there, and she can see because it's in a mine tunnel, it's never been compacted by rain or anything like that. So with her hand, she's able to, to dig it out, and she exposes the whole skeleton. She tries to recover the two skeletons. It's a long story. Uh, she tries to hide them. A flash flood washes everything away, and all she's able to recover is the two skulls with a little bit of damage to each from being tumbled down in the, in the flash flood. Long story, not worth getting okay. okay to that. So she recovers the she recovers the skulls and she brings them home, and she keeps them as souvenirs. And as she grows up, she shellacks the skulls to preserve them, which people did back then. Puts them in a cardboard box, keeps them her whole life. <laughs> basically in her garage in El Paso, Texas. And as she's dying in the early 90s, she wills them like you would pets or something like that to some friends. Her husband was a Border Patrol agent. He wasn't that comfortable with having two skulls in a box in the garage. <laughs> so the friends say, yeah, we'll take them. And they keep them for five years. But he's an FBI agent. And he's not that comfortable with it either. So then they meet this couple called Ray and Melanie Young. And Melanie is a neonatal nurse, been a neonatal nurse for 15 years. So he said, would you mind having a deformed, because that's what they believe, that the weird skull was a deformed skull. Would you mind having a deformed skull? And, you know, this lady died, and we don't want to throw it away. And, and they said, yeah, sure, we'll take it. So next slide. Ray and Melanie, again, all these people in El Paso, Texas, Melanie Ray, obviously. And Melanie had, had been a neonatal nurse, as I said, and she took one look at it, and she says, it's not a human deformity. That is too light, it's too symmetrical, 
It doesn't look anything like a human. It doesn't have human anything. This is not a human deformity. And she, and both she and Ray were members of MUFON, Mutual UFO Network of El Paso. And so Melanie says to Ray, I think it's the skull that would fit in the head of a gray alien. Mm -hmm. Because when you, when you hear the prototypical descriptions of gray aliens, they have that large kind of heart-shaped build here with that, that crease down the middle, and they have that very fine pointed lower face, and she says, it's got all of that. I think it's that. And he says, you know, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll find out, but he's not as convinced as she is. So they take it out to a couple of experts in El Paso, I mean, real true experts from the universities and stuff, and they, they just tell them immediately, it's a cradle boarded hydrocephalic, take it home, forget about it, don't worry about it, it's nothing, it's a cradle boarded hydrocephalic, which I also heard many times. It's the standard reply of somebody who doesn't want to deal with it, who doesn't know what they're talking about, and they just want it out of their place, out of their, out of their space. So, uh, when they got that, Melanie says, these people give us run around, we need somebody that'll work on it. So they went to the El Paso uh, MUFON meeting and they said, who in the field of alternative knowledge knows anything about skulls? And that's how my name came up. They said, there's this guy in Louisiana, Lloyd Pye, he talks about skulls. In my other work, with hominoids and human origins and things like that. So everybody always asks, how'd you get it? That's how I got it. So they said, the next time you're in El Paso, would you come by? We have something to show you. They showed me, and I thought it had to be some kind of deformity. But I didn't know what. I'd never seen anything like it before. But the idea of holding an alien skull in my hands was, at first, very impossible. Just, just couldn't be. Like finding the Dead Sea Scrolls or something. Mm -hmm. Couldn't do it. But by the end of that year, but I said, it, it is very weird, and I will try to find out for you what it is. And I began to take it to experts, and I began to get the answers that I would get from the expert, was it, whether it was ear or brain or neck or face or head or whatever. Uh, I can't explain my part of it. I've never seen it, but every, I know it has to be some kind of deformity. Everything else has to be covered, but I can't explain my part of it. We have 10 or 12 guys say, I can't tell you my specialty area. I can't explain it, but it has to be some kind of deformity. You know they're all just flailing for an answer. Anyway, next slide. This is the two skulls lined up together. That's the human one that was found. A couple of different shots here. And that's, of course, the star child. And you see the differences in every, every position. You have 25 major physical differences. There is not a single similarity on this skull to that skull. There's not a point of reference on the skull where you can say that's exactly the same in human and star child. Everything is different. Next slide. We start out here with the front view of the adult female and the star child skull. Note the eye sockets, the difference in the eye sockets, the brow ridges, brow ridges, you know, this, this swelling here is a brow ridge, brow ridges, nasal dip, you have a dip in the nose, no dip in the nose. Completely different starting out at those basic things. Next slide. Profile you see that a human eye socket is about two inches deep. My finger would go in to that much. If here, the star child, it would go like about that. It's about a half inch. So you have a, an amazing difference there. Then you have, again, the brow ridges. All humans have that. The star child doesn't have a trace of brow ridge. You have the dip in the nose where you come down off the brow ridge to the nose. Star child goes, as you see, just like a ski jump right down. So completely different, just starting again at these very basic things. Next slide. With the uh, profile shot you hear, the, these brace bones that you see here, people say, what's this? It's, it's called a pterygoid plate, and you have two of them, one on each side of your face, up under there, and it braces your maxilla, right? So if you get a really good shot in the grill, it doesn't just go right back in and, and crush your brain and kill you. So this, this is one of the most important bones in your body in terms of physical impact in your face. Got to have a pterygoid plate, you're no good. But as you see, the size of this one versus the size of this one. The ear holes are different too. This is shoved over, but that does have an ear hole. The, we'll, we'll talk about this, but this is the zygomatic arch, and you see here it flares out and goes around. Here it's tucked in much tighter to the face because it's going to have a much tighter face. And the inion, we all have an inion. Anything with a head on a neck has a spot back there. You can all feel your own you have a knot back there. It's called the Indian. It's where your neck muscles attach. You see the human has one. Star Child does not. In fact, it has a dent you're going to see. It's not just 
different, it's like super different. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, top view, the crowns. You see that a normal human skull is rounded in the crown back and the star child has an abnormal, very strange crease but it's very symmetrical. It's more symmetrical in the way it's put together than is the human skull that is a typical human skull. All of our skulls are asymmetrical. Star shell is very symmetrical, surprisingly symmetrical. Next slide. Now, the rear view of the sutures and the Indians, you see how the difference in the rear of the head is. This is the same pretty much volume of bone here for the occipital, but it's like somebody took it and just pulled it up and straightened it out. And this is the same three-point junction of the, of the mm -hmm. cranial, you know, do you know about the plates of your brain when you're born? These are separated by lit and held together by ligaments so that you can squeeze out your mother's birth canal. Mm -hmm. Your head turns into a tube while it's going out, and then it comes out and very quickly it expands up, and over the next two years, they fill in with these things like this, and they seal. And, and that's in two years, and the last part to go is the part up here, the soft spot, the fontanel. Okay, so that's how that works. Now the Indian, again, human Indian bump a dent here. You can, you can feel it. It's, a, it's an absolute indentation where there should be a, an extrusion. <coughs> Next slide. Okay, the balance points of the cranium is very interesting. With a human face, I mean a human skull rather, the face is imbalanced because we have those deep eye sockets. We have big uh, frontal sinuses in here. We have, we have hollow noses, hollow mouths, so it's like a fat kid and a skinny kid. You've got to move it, you've got to move the fulcrum back in favor of the, the, skin, the, fat, uh, the skinny kid to give them more, more leverage. So our, our necks are centered, you can just see mine or anybody's, back of center mm -hmm. to, to make it work right. The star child is completely different. Its balance point is dead center down the middle because you got all this here and you're missing this back here and you got all this here and you're missing you're missing the air up front because you've got that very shallow eye socket you have no sinuses which you'll see in a minute and you've got a very small lower face so the fulcrum has to be moved over and the center of gravity has to be moved over such that it's dead center what does that allow it to do one thing is it has a very skinny neck which we're going to see very skinny neck now, you guys know cricket, so I'll use a cricket example. You take a cricket bat and you hold it down at the handle and you hold it absolutely straight vertically. Any of you can hold it like this very easily. You move it two, three degrees off of dead center and suddenly you start to strain because mm -hmm. the weight suddenly increases. We have that with our, our heads and our necks. This is balanced on that skinny little neck like the cricket bat held absolutely mm -hmm. vertically. Next slide. This is the brain, the different pressures on the cerebellum. Now, your cerebellum is an area back here about the size of my fist in the back of your brain back here, and that is you. This is your software. All this stuff about your thinking capacity and all that, you need that, yeah, but this runs you. This is, this is your urine, your, your bowels, your heartbeat, your blood pumping. This is your software that never stops running. This is you. You heard that? You're dead. Russians, you know, they execute you, they nail you down, one bullet in that, gone. That, you know, the cerebellum, you just can't go without that. So with this one, as you see, sorry, with the human, all this three pound weight presses down on this. Well, this is designed in such a way that it's in the curve here because it has to hold up for the course of your life in good shape. It can't allow this pressure to come down and squeeze it out of the neck hole mm -hmm. because you're gonna, you'll die if that happens. Mm -hmm. So it has to be mm -hmm. set in place. So it's set in the curve of the back of your head, and there are ridges of bone in here that it sets and holds up against so that it's, it's built really, really well to do what it has to do. The star child doesn't have that. Those, those ridges are just down to nubs. They're not really there. And you have all this brain back here pressing down this way, so it's like a, you know, a fat kid going down a slipper slide. It should just be swoosh right out of the neck hole. So when the brain guy, first brain guy saw it, he was doing all this, he says, you know, this thing either doesn't have a cerebellum like we have, or whatever its brain material is made of, it's three or four times harder than ours. It's, it's like much more gelatinous than ours. And our brain is pretty doggone gelatinous. <laughs> It's got to be really, really hard to stay in this head at this angle without coming out of the neck hole. You with me? 
So again, everything different. Next slide. All right, now, this is the underside and the neck and what it all looks like. Now, this is called the basilar part, and that doesn't really seal in individuals until we're about 25 years old, 20 to 25. Oh. Yeah, so this is kind of loose until then. So this is an adult. It's sealed, but the star child lost theirs. Now, this could have been it was younger than the sealing age, or it just could have bumped a rock and just knocked it out in the tumble in the water. But nonetheless, the basilar part would be there. Otherwise, everything's the same. It's pretty much the same size. What is it for? The basilar why part is just part of the brain holding. It's a very stout, thick bone that, again, is keeping pressure off of this in the event of a hit in the front. Because if anything happens to this, you're toast. So you've got some protective. You you're, you're, remember the things we were just talking about? The yes. Tideway plates that they are. So it's just part of the bracing mechanism of protecting your... your You've got any ideas about why it doesn't complete itself till 20? It's interesting because I've always thought people aren't physically completed till they're 25. Keep telling my daughter. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're the first person to ever ask that. I do not know, but it's probably look upable. I'm okay. Sorry, I don't have an answer for you. But what you really see is the difference in the shape and the size of the neck. It's about half the volume and it's an, uh, an oval rather than a circle. Very different. Next slide. Okay, the areas of neck muscle attachment, and this is what we were talking about a minute ago. The, you have the, the indentation here of the inion. The neck muscles should be attaching up here if they were human, but you see the fossa down here, and you have this little area of attachment. Big area of muscle attachment here. You can see the giant, the, the width of the fossa right here, which are down to this here. And so you see the size of this, and this is the inion, inion, inion. So just redesign, a complete redesign that's so com so bizarrely different and yet it's functioning, it's living, it, it dies as an adult. We don't know how old. Next slide. It's not a child. The zygomatic arches, cheekbones, if you see just this is a draw-in of what they normally look like and this is the star child and you see how, how much compressed the, the lower face is. All the signs of it are. Next slide. This is the chewing muscles that come up under the, under the cheekbones and they spread out like this, and all of us, you chew a little bit, and you, know, you can feel them moving right up there, and the star child's are right here. About half the volume of chewing muscle attachment. Again, a clear sign that the face is very, very reduced relative to a normal face. <coughs> Next slide. Now, this x-ray showed the star child lacked any vestige of frontal sinuses. You see the frontal sinuses in the human, that's the eye sockets right there, and you see in the star child, it's eye sockets, and you don't see even a vestige of it. Normally when a person is born, even if they're born without sinuses, and you can be born with one of these bigger than the other one, you can be born with screwed up sinuses, but you're just not born with nothing there. That, that's just, you know, your body tries to do it, even if it does it wrong. Mm -hmm. It knows to do that. So, what you, and what your sinuses are for, it's very interesting. You think it's for uh, helping you with disease and colds and things like that, because that's what the, the, uh, the medicine companies tell you when you do commercials and all your sinuses. Not so. What your sinuses are really for is to make your voice resonant, to make your voice speak like a human. Because if you don't have sinuses, you talk like a robot, like one of those things like that. You have no resonance whatsoever. Right? So, and you hear people that have damaged or very bad sinuses, and that's how they sound. They don't sound, they sound weird. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> it's, it's beginning a sign that maybe the star child doesn't speak. The little bitty neck, the lack of the sinuses, the very big brain, this is an indication that maybe it doesn't speak. It communicates by telepathy, which everybody says that's how the greys uh, communicate. Mm -hmm. Next slide. All right, the CAT scan shows the star child's inner ears are twice the size, and this is just representative. It's the same thing, but uh, humans are about this size, and the star child's are just double, double as big. Inner ears. Now, why would you have you know, your inner ears are for your balance. Why would you have any bigger, better balance? Well, if you've got a big head sitting on a skinny little neck, you might need a finer adjustment to, to keep it where it is than just these big muscles that we have that can do that job. Maybe it's a more balanced, a more fine balancing thing, and that's what they would be for. It's the best answer we have. Next slide. Okay, now this is really cool. Um, exterior surface of bone. In a human, you have these things called lacunae. Now, we've all heard the story that our cells change out every seven years, right? You know, in every seven years, everything but our brain changes out. Well, this is how it does in bone. 
bone is constantly coming up through these things and being recycled out, and new bone is coming in, and it happens through the lacunae. All right? Every, all bone has that. Store child doesn't have it, as you see. Now, if you're going to be a deformity, what? Where would that go? And you're going to live. Where would that go? Very important thing. And you see, it's just like little closed out nodes, but they're not, they're not functional. Next slide. All right. This is the mass spectrometry of the human bone. And you see that there are spikes in carbon oxygen, calcium, phosphorus, oxygen, carbon. But kind of get this in your mind. This is human bone, the way it is set up chemically, by you know, the chemical parts of the bone. Next slide, star child. You look at the difference. Again, the calcium and the phosphorus. Look at the oxygen and the carbon. What is this? What does this look like? You don't know. It's collagen the collagen of your, of your teeth. Like, your teeth are the hardest bones in your body because it has an overload of collagen. You know, when you have your teeth drilled and you have that horrible icky smell, that smell, we all know that smell, that's burning collagen. It's not burning tooth, it's burning collagen. And so, what this means is that the star child's bone is solid wall-to-wall -wall tooth. It's much, much harder than human bone. Next slide. This is the piece of maxilla, the detached piece of maxilla, and that's this piece up here. And you see that it had a nose opening, and you see the two teeth when there were two teeth. You see it here like this. We eventually took this tooth for, for testing, a big mistake, big disaster. But anyway, nonetheless, this is how it looked. Next slide. You'll see it together, and you see those two fused together to make this. But guess what? This is flat. There's no arch at all. This is flat. So it indicates that it has a small tongue or no tongue at all. And that goes again to the idea that maybe it communicates by telepathy. Next slide. Now this is that piece of maxilla after the tooth is gone, but x-ray, so that you can see that it has uninterrupted teeth in there. And when we first took the first x-ray of this, the guy said, well, if you've got uninterrupted teeth and you've got teeth down, it's got to be a child. And that's where the name star child came from. Later, we found out that the sutures were of an adult and that these teeth, as you'll see in a minute, are, are heavily worn. So this could be a being that, like a shark, when, it, when its tooth wears down, it can replace, which would indicate that maybe it has a lifespan of 200 years, 300 years, 500 years. We don't know. But it could have a very extended lifespan, and if it did, and if it eats like we do, and it seems to, it's going to need this over time. And there it is. Next slide. So, and here you see this, this tooth when it was pulled out, and it's clearly not a kid tooth. But you also see this. This is crazing, what's called uh, crazing. It's cracking of the enamel before death. If these are white, you know it happened post-mortem, and it's just the tooth shrinking up as you die. But if it's stained by food, berries, whatever, you know that this is crazing in life. And it's hard. You've got to, like, chew ice for 10 years to, to crack this. But you can also see the, the chips chips, chips, where they're eating, eating uh, food that's stone ground with a pestle and it's leaving little pieces of grit and they're, they're biting on that. But it's an adult. The whole point of this is this is not a child's tooth. It's an adult. Next slide. Okay, this shows the cutting. Remember I told you that there was the cutting done and all that? And, and it's, it's pretty extensive and it's unfortunate. And there's stuff cutting on the top of the head too. So. I hate it, but we've still got the majority of them, as you can see. We've got like 80% left or more, but we have had to. But look at the, you get a good shot, a good difference of the depth of the eye sockets. Uh, very, very different. All right, next slide. How does mainstream science attempt to explain the star child? Well, they say Mother Nature can do anything, create any kind of deformity of a mutation or variation, no matter how bizarre or unlikely something looks. Nature is fully capable of it. I don't, I don't know why that's not there. but. That's their answer, that when, when we would bring these physical differences, these incredible physical differences that would make any real, normal, natural scientist jump up and down and say, boy, this is really cool. We need to find out what this is. This is not something they want to know. This is not something they want to dig into because they know it's going to upset a lot of apple carts. And so they just say, well, nature can do anything. And I had them tell me that. When I, I, I would say, all these things, they said, look, I don't care how many of these things you bring me. I don't care how many you bring me. All I have to say is nature can do anything, and we win. 
And it's no different than religion where they say, I don't care what you say, all I got to do is say God can do anything and I win. You know, nature is the God of science. And they use it the same way religion uses God. They do, when things they don't want to deal with, that's, that's what they, that's their go-to guy is God and their go-to gal is nature. And that's, it's unfortunate, but it makes it a very, very hard road to hoe to get anywhere with these people because they've got you beaten with that. Next slide. But we can work around them. We've got 10 experts here who officially state the star child is not a known deformity. And then, and then there's more down on the bottom, one more on the bottom. But there you go. Um, and these, these guys are on the star child having done a report. And now the thing about these guys is they all saw the skull. They all held it and, and examined it and gave their opinion. All the people that you see on the internet that are like saying, oh, it's just a human deformity and all this, I've never seen it. They're just going from reading one report of somebody who said they didn't see it, and they say, I read a report that says it was not real, and so I say it's not real, and like that. Next slide. How do internet critics, skeptics, trolls explain why the star child was cradleboarded, it suffered from hydrocephaly, it suffered from progeria? Those are the three things that they will tell you. Now, we're going to go over each of those and, and see if that's right or not. Next slide. Cradle boarding, typical cradle boarding, uh, and an x-ray showing effects on a human skull. Cradle boarding is when native peoples strap a baby onto a board and the woman carries the baby on her back so she can go about doing her daily work. Well, when you're born, and this, the human that was with the star child was indeed cradle boarded. For that area was very typical, very typical in, in uh, primitive societies 900 years ago. I should have said the star child we found was uh, died, both of them died, they've been carbon-14 tested to 900 years ago, so this was not uncommon. And, but what happens is when you, when you put a baby on a cradle board and you, stri you have to strap its head down, you can't just go doing your work like this, the baby's head is the biggest part of its body on a very weak neck and it'll break its neck, or hurt its neck for sure. So you have to strap the head down. And when you do that, you just put a little band around it, the bones are so soft, you're going to get a flattened area about the size of my palm on the back of the head, right down to the Indian, beyond which it won't go because you've got muscles starting right there. And you'd have to tear the muscles off to, to go any further, right? So this is what cradle boarding looks like. Now, next slide. This is the cradle boarding, and this is the star child. Now, notice the big difference. The convolutions are there right through, the natural convolutions of the bone. They're not flat. The human, is that's as flat as a board, a table, the floor. But that's not. And you can see the convolutions right here. Now, a moron can see this. <laughs> yeah, a moron can see this and know that it's not cradle board. Hmm. And yet, you go right onto Wikipedia right now, and you will see that it's a cradle board and hydrospallic, or, or hydrospallic for sure. All right, next slide. Next slide, yeah, sorry. Now this is another thing about cradle boarding, the positions when cradle boarded. This is how the heads are set up. Well, to be cradle boarded, this guy fits perfectly he's sitting there and it's, you know, just grooving, chucking, no problem. Put the star child in that, you know, going to die in just a few minutes. Again, a moron can see it. Next slide. Now, hydrocephaly, different thing than cradle boarding. They always, always say it's cradle boarded hydrocephalic. Hydrocephaly, we all know water on the brain. Well, the water comes in and it, and it goes out in all directions. It's like blowing up a balloon. Blowing up, it doesn't, it doesn't differentiate. It blows up. It's fluid, and it's fluid coming in, and it's got to go somewhere. So it's, for an infant, it, these aren't sutured. These aren't, you know, closed together. They aren't, and so they'll spread out, and they do, and it just gets bigger, bigger, bigger until the kid dies. What happens is the pressure pushes the brain out the neck hole like we were talking about, and that, that's what will eventually, it doesn't just blow up like a, overblown balloon, it just squeezes the neck out, uh, squeezes the brain out through the neck hole and, and it dies. Next slide. Here's another one and you see, now you could say that the star child might be, might have hydrocephaly if this was, you know, because you can't blow a balloon up and have a crease in the balloon. But if this suture line was fused, then it could. If it was prematurely fused and kids can be born, I don't know if you've ever seen those kids that I don't have any more, they had one in my community when they're born with this thing fused right here, this suture fused, they grow up and their brain grows forward and their eyes go out to the side of their heads. You ever see one of those, those fish-eyed kids? 
they would institutionalize them and have to do all kind of surgery to make it go right. Really sad case, but they fix it now when they have the problem. They, they can suture it and I mean, uh, to make a shunt and, and it just doesn't happen anymore. But if this were to be have been fused, then it wouldn't have allowed it to grow like a balloon. But, next slide. What we see is that it wasn't fused either here or here because this is the inside. We've got a camera up inside shooting this way of this place right here. See it right there. And you can see the light coming through in different spots. It's clearly not fused. It's not just locked like that. It's, it's normal. This is normal suturing. That is too. Next slide. Now, last but not least, look at the vein tracks. When your brain presses up, you could say, okay, there's two kinds of hydrocephaly. There's water in the brain and there's water on the brain. Water on the brain being the more common. But you can have sometimes water leaking out in the brain. But water on the brain is the normal standard thing. Well, you see here, you've got these vein tracks where the brain presses up into the soft bone and leaves the tracks. Perfectly normal. And you see the same thing with the star child. They're just in a you know, different place in a different way, but there they are. No water on the brain. Moron level. <laughs> Moron level. And mainstream science can't figure it out. Mm. Next slide. Okay. Progeria. This is their new favorite because really I make them pay for that hydrocephaly, you know, creative voided hydrocephaly. I make them look really stupid. So they've come up with this one as, a, as an alternative, progeria. Now, in typical progeria victims, their bones do thin out. Because progeria is that disease where you're born and you immediately start getting old. Mm -hmm. You start aging rapidly and dramatically and you die about the age. If you make it to 15, you have really done well as a progeria victim. All right? So as you can see, this kid will be, what, three? And, and it's already clear that you know, he's on his way, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But that's true. The bones do thin out. So this is why the mainstream jumped on it. Well, the star child has those thin bones. Progeria victims have thin bones. But they don't take into account, next slide, that the star child's bone is so much harder. Now, yes, it is thin. Look, I mean, look how much thinner it is. And yet, when you cut this, and I have with a handsaw, you can cut through this. At, it isn't easy. I mean, it's bone. But this is like cutting sheet metal by comparison to this. Mm -hmm. This is really, really hard stuff. Hard stuff, two or three times or more. We don't really know. We don't know how to scale it. I can just tell you from cutting it. And everybody that's cut it, I'm not the only person doing it. Five people have cut it. All say the same thing. God damn, that's hard. Mm -hmm. And it is. I mean, there's just no other way to say it. It is really hard. OK, next slide. Progeria victims have greatly reduced lower faces, and so does the star child. And this is another thing they say. Well, it's got the thin bones. It's got the thin face. Progeria victim, right? Next slide. Oh, you'll see this in a minute. But it's not the same skull shape. It's not the same skull at all. It's, it's you know, it's got the normal brow ridge and nose. It's got the Indian back there. It's, it's just not. It's not. A progeria victim is still a human. A, a very unfortunate human but a human nonetheless, with all of the human traits. Their eyes will go into the depth. Their eyes don't do this, or their eyes would bug out like frog eyes because there wouldn't be any room in there for a normal eyeball. So they got normal eyes. they got normal human physiology that the star child just doesn't have. Next slide. And last but not least, progeria victims nearly always have an open fontanel. It doesn't close. And of course, the star child is a you know, perfectly normal farm now. Not progeria. Next slide. How do inter internet critics, skeptics, and trolls explain away the star child? It was created warrior hydrocephalic progeria. And if that one rolled up a little bit, you would see none of the above. The answer is none of the above. None of that's true. None of that. Next slide. So if the star child skull was not a deformity or a combination of deformities and it was not caused by typical cradle boarding or hydrocephaly or progeria, then what the, as my father used to say, blankety blank, was it? Mm. What the hell was it? All right, next slide. This is an image by Rob Roy Menzies, which is a fusion of x-ray and, and, and drawing to fit what was there. Very clever way, I think, to go about, you know, to go about doing it. Next slide. This is a cover image of the book Communion versus the Star Child by Rob Roy in the end. This was his final product after he shaped that face. Now this is the prototypical gray alien 
But Bud Hopkins told me one time after seeing this, he says, you know, this cover we use when we when we talk to abductees, he says, we'll put that in front of them and we'll say, is this what you saw? And if they say, oh yeah, that's, that's exactly what I saw, he says, we know that person is probably stretching it because this was put on that cover to sell books. Mm -hmm. It wasn't put on the cover to be dramatic. In fact, Whitley Strieber himself argued against to the publisher not to put that. He said, but that doesn't look anything like him. He said, yeah, but it'll scare the hell out of everybody and they'll sell you book. <laughs> and it did. That's one of the most arresting book covers. You know, it just sold millions of copies off, off of that cover staring out at you out, out of a book rack. And so uh, Bud says this looks much more like when we, when we hear them described by people who are genuine abductees, it's much more like this than like that. Thanks a lot. So forensic sculptor Bill Munns, this is another guy, who made a clay model of how the star child might have looked when alive. And this is it from, from both angles. Next slide. Let's see. Now this is where we find out if it works or not. Yes! <laughs> the animation of the star child sculpture. And you see Bill putting it together. Now, the neck's a little, in my opinion, too big. The eyes are ridiculous because he had to cut the... When I saw it, I said, I said, Bill, what are you doing with those eyes? Those eyes look like normal. I said, you couldn't put an eyeball in there, a human eye, because you, know, you have eyeballs to make... He said, oh, yeah, you're right. The eye looked like a big frog eye sticking off there. It didn't work at all. And I said, well, what did you do? And he said, I just cut it in half. <laughs> and I said, well, well, you know, the eye isn't at all accurate. He says, yeah, but Lloyd, you can't have real human eyes in those eye sockets. If it's got eyes, they have to look something like this, you know. So, and the neck's a little wide. He, he wanted, he just, he couldn't live with that little pipe still neck. <laughs> so it looks like this is going to break off, you know, and he didn't want to have it, the neck break off. Bump it accidentally and break off or something like that. But anyway, so now hit it again. Animation redux, now that you know about the eye. Now watch the half eye socket. You see the half eyeballs in there? And, and the, the little neck he flashes out. But that's still pretty cool. Now, a lot of people ask, you know, me, do, do you think it's possible that the star child could uh, could ever, you know, be among us or somebody like the star child? Would we know it? You know, next slide. And I guess, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself there. Proportional analysis, no, that's it. You, you are okay, right here. This is really cool, and I forgot that I added this just recently. Proportional analysis of star child faced by Chris Murphy. And what he says is that our faces are really built interestingly. Our eyes are at the 50% mark. The tips of our nose are at 25% uh, of what's left. And then our, chin, our mouth is at 12.5%, 12.5% to our chin. Our faces have pretty good balance within percentages. The star child's nothing like that. It's 57% down, 11% instead of 25, 15% instead of 12.5, 70% instead of 12. Anyway, it's very, you know, different. The facial proportions are very different. Now the thing was, can, can they move around <laughs> among us? Hey, there you go. Next slide. Can they move around us? Uh, <laughs> I have Vivian to thank for that. She came up with that. Yeah, but Paul McCartney is the wrong Paul McCartney. Yeah, that's right. That could be. It could be the wrong one, yeah. <laughs> Next slide. Next slide. Okay, two things found in the star child bone. Now, this is really interesting. Two things found in the star child bone are not found in the bones of any other creatures on Earth that are known at this point. Unknown fibers are embedded in the matrix of its bone, and unknown lead residue is in its cancellous holes. You'll see both. Next slide. This is the fibers, and this is the cancellous holes, and this is just a piece of the bone that you saw that we cut out that you saw. And when you look at it under a microscope, this is what you see. You see these fibers dangling out of the holes and strung around it. And they are unbelievably, unbelievably durable themselves because that's a Dremel blade. You see these things here? That's a Dremel blade doing it, you know, making these cuts. And yet they're resisting the cut of the Dremel blade. So that tells you how strong they are. And they are embedded in the matrix of the bone like rebar through concrete. Now we're going to see some up close. Next slide. We'll see this knot up close. Next slide. You see this knot here, that knot there, and then we see these two over here up close and we see that they're different. But here you see what's important to see is it's coming out of the, 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 this track of the bone here and it got snapped up here and it seems to have been pushed up through here and this thicker kind got wrapped around it in a way that we can't imagine. We just, it's like how a magician did it or something, I don't know. But anyway, 
and you see a different kind. But these things are in the matrix of this bone. And what they do is they add to the strength of the, the, the collagen, the, the heavy, heavy collagen, that's reinforced with that. Why does it need such strength in such thin bone? Who knows? And it might have to do with inter, inter, intergalactic travel or something like that. We do know that when, when our people are up on the, you know, the space station, their bones weaken, and one of the first things that happens when they come back is they find that their eye sockets have shrunk a bit. Mm -hmm. Everybody comes back seeing a little different if they've been in there three months or more. Their eye stock, sockets start to shallow, the mm -hmm. humans. Mm -hmm. And you see the star child with its shallow eye socket. So there's something about being in space that does that. Really weird. Okay, next slide. This is another isolated flat fiber. This is yet another kind of fiber. We, we just don't understand these fibers, but we do know that they didn't just grow on it because the bone was, you know, it was just come off the thing and they were there. So it wasn't, it isn't, my, we have mycologists look at it. It's not, not uh, anything bacteria, fungi, mold, nothing like that. They're there. And this is, you can see a frayed piece right here where this piece got hit by the dremel blade. Instead of cutting it, it just frayed. Strong stuff, whatever that is. Next slide. And this, this you see a perfect shot on the inner part of the bone of it lying in the matrix so that there's just no argument that this stuff is in the matrix of the bone. Next slide. Now this is the, the reddish residue we're going to look at. Now this is chips of bone cut but not polished. This is where you cut them but we, we haven't polished either one, the human or the star child. And you see how much milkier it looks because it's got that much higher collagen content. Next slide. You see the human bone, when it's polished, and this is the same piece of bone, but that hole is that hole, this hole is this hole. So you see, and that's the outer, and this is the inner surface of it. But you see that in the course of death, when you die and when you're decomposing, in the natural course of events, you are carrying bacteria in your body that is designed to wait until you die and clean you out. Just clean you out. And it will clean out your, your, your um, not your collagen, your, um, what's, in, what's in the marrow. marrow. Sorry, marrow. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. It will clean out your bone marrow like you see right here to the, to the point where you can eat out of it. I mean, it's just beautiful. This was, it, it, to me, it looks like alabaster, but it was very carefully polished, like with lapidary tools, like jewelers polish it. And this is what you get. And, it, and it's really nice. And this is how you see. There's not a shred of marrow left anywhere. It shouldn't be, and it isn't with the human. Next slide. And with the star child, it's completely different. You've got this reddish residue all over the place. Now, that's not going to be blood mar uh, um, marrow because that's blood, and it's going to be black if it's oxygen. You know, when it's, when it's oxidized, it's something else, and we don't know what it is. And we just don't have the money. The, the problem with what we have is we have this incredible thing with all these neat things to find out, and we can't get the money to do anything with it because science doesn't want this answer. I've had this stuff out for 13. I'm on my 14th year now. Any of them could have come forward and said, we want to know too. They don't because they don't want to know. They want to have me floundering out here as long as... I, as long as they can keep me away, they will. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat them eventually. I know I am, but it's been a hard road. But this stuff is what keeps me going because I know it's for real. Next slide. Here you'll see another shot of it, backlit, so that you see plenty of it. It isn't just a fluke thing. Something going on here. We, have no, we wish we knew what it was, but we don't. Next slide. Oh, gosh. Always tough. Um, anyway. Dozens of physical differences when you can see this thing real. What, what I'm saying here is what counts as DNA? All the physical stuff doesn't matter. We can, we can stack physical stuff up to the roof. It isn't going to win. DNA will win. DNA is their tool. We can run, as I say, run the bastards through with their own sword. Mm -hmm. Just take it from them and run them through, and that's what we're going to do. So that's what that means. Next slide. And I'm going to go over the DNA now, and we're going to start. <clears throat> got to kind of put your thinking cap on here to understand some of this to get through it. Everything about the star child skull's case comes down to its DNA. DNA is a molecule of life. This is a cell, and inside the nucleus are the chromosomes. Chromosomes. The chromosomes come down, and they unravel. You unravel the chromosomes, and you're looking at the DNA, 
and the DNA is made up of the bases, we're going to see that in a minute, and what the, what the DNA does is the good, not the junk, the stuff that works makes proteins. What you have to understand is about 97% of the, your whole, all of this, of everything in here, 97% is junk or non-coding or whatever you want to call it. It doesn't make the proteins. About 3% of this runs us. The rest of it is like, what is it there for? We're still trying to figure that out. It could be spirit, it could be a number of nucleotides. Mm -hmm. These are the base pairs that the two nucleotides come together and make. So that term is used kind of interchangeably. When you say a nucleotide, you know, if you know the nucleotide, you know what its partner is automatically. So all you need is the nucleotide, and you know it's a base pair because you know what the other side of it is going to be. So you can strip them apart like this and get to nucleotides, and you know what goes on the other side of it. So nucleotide base pairs, don't be confused by that. It's essentially the same thing. We tend to use base pairs. But if you see nucleotides, it's not a problem. So you have all of this. And all three billion of them are wound up like a wad of rubber bands in the nucleus of the cells that we saw just a minute ago. They're just like rubber bands, just wadded up. And that's it. Very, very tightly packed. Next slide. All right. Each human cell, except red blood cells, has nuclear DNA and mitochondrial DNA. You need to understand this. <coughs> mitochondrial DNA, this is, this is the, the cells in our body, all of our cells except our red blood cells have a nucleus. Nuclear DNA is found in the cell nucleus and contains genetic material from both parents. Mom and dad make the whole genome. Mom supplies her um, 23 chromosomes, dad supplies his 23 chromosomes, and you get 46 total. That is that each cell nucleus has 3 plus billion, keep this in mind, 3 plus billion nuclear DNA base pairs. 3 plus billion. Now, mitochondrial DNA, that only comes down from your mother. Now, the mitochondria float outside the nucleus, but in the cell cytoplasm, like raisins in pudding or something like that. But there, there can be hundreds to thousands of them, depending on which cell we're talking about here. Now, that comes, mitochondrial DNA is found in the cell mitochondria. Now, these are the energy points. These are the power plants. These make the proteins and do, this does the work. This just sits and, and is sort of king of the hill, but this, may, this does the work. It contains genetic material only from the mother. Why? Because an egg has plenty of room. You've all seen films of the little, little bitty sperm coming and hitting the egg. So the egg carries the mitochondria. The sperm is nothing but just the DNA package and a tail. Mm. The, the, the egg has her DNA package and all the mitochondria. So it only comes down from the mother. So the mother, the grandmother, the great-grandmother, the great-great-grandmother, right on back, they all have the same mitochondrial DNA. I have the same mitochondrial DNA. You have the same mitochondrial DNA of your mother, your grandmother, your great-grandmother, going on back with very little change. Mm -hmm. very, and so that's why all human mitochondria contain 16,569 base pairs. Sometimes one up, sometimes one down, sometimes 70 or 68, but the number we, we nearly always share is 16,000. 569, precisely, all the time, and each, wow. each cell holds thousands. Now, the difference is, this is swapped around from the nuclear DNA. The nuclear DNA is 97% junk, 3% working, right? This is 97% working, 3% junk. Wow. So this doesn't change much. It doesn't allow much room. You can have a lot of mutations in here, because the odds are it's going to hit in the junk and isn't going to have a real major impact on the functioning of the body. But in here, you get, you get a, a mutation or a change or a difference here, and you hit out in that 97% that's working, you're going to have problems. And if you have faulty mitochondrial DNA, don't have kids because they aren't going to make it. Mm -hmm. That's where they're, they, if they find women who have faulty DNA, they have one or two or three miscarriages and they figure it out, they start taking their their um, genetic package out, but they'll take the egg of a woman who doesn't have the mitochondrial DNA. So their kids will be born with the, the genetic package of mom and the genetic package of dad, but the mitochondrial DNA of a third woman. But you can have your own children that way. A couple can have their own children. Very cool how this works. But anyway, all right, next slide. 
This is early DNA testing used primers, 20 to 30 base pairs long, below is an early array in a gel sheet. Now this is important to understand because you have to understand the story of the Star Child's early DNA testing. Next slide. The first testing was done at the University of British Columbia. <coughs> I made a mistake. I, we, we, we couldn't, there were only six labs in the world that could do nuclear DNA at that time. None of them would touch the Star Child. And so there was this lab here. It was a new lab. It was a dental forensic lab, totally incapable of dealing with ancient DNA. And the guy said, well, I'll just try to find out if, if you have live uh, DNA there. Because sometimes a skeleton uh, bones can be so degraded that they, they just can't recover anything, but either mitochondrial or nuclear DNA. He says, I can't recover mitochondrial, but I can recover nuclear. And if I find anything nuclear, you'll at least know it's worth trying to gather the money and keep going. So I said, OK, great. Next slide. So what he came up with was after, after two times where they contaminated it, and a third time, they came up with this result. Now, by then, a guy on the team, one of the kids there, again, this is a university. This is a, a main geneticist and kids and students doing the work. And they're just screwing it up. They're just contaminating it every time, the first two times. And they did it again this time, too. But by then, the rest of the university had heard what they were doing, that they were working on maybe an alien skull and the, the other professors dropped down on and now they were just trying to get rid of us, get us off the camp, you know, get us out of the deal. So he said, after the customary number of PCR cycles, 28, there was a very weak 200 picograms gender profile from the second bone sample taken from the child's mastoid process. Now, normally, 1,000 picograms were the usual minimum threshold at which you could tell anything about what you had. And the guy says, we only got 200 picograms, but we know that it's a result of an XY chromosome, which tells us two things, the child was male and it was human, right? This is a totally BS report and a totally BS answer. But the problem was, in, in 20, late 2099, uh, that that went out as the official answer. And it was exactly the answer that mainstream science wanted, human male. End of story, end of tape. We don't have to worry about the star child anymore. And so to this day, you will read that this is the answer, that it was already proved to be human, even though this was in 99 when they were using um, um, primers of 20 to 30 base pairs long, and it was easy to make mistakes, and these guys didn't even get it. They didn't even get it, because why do we know? The next slide. But now this, you have to understand, this caused a disaster to our team. We couldn't get a hearing anywhere. The bowl lab report equaled three years of dead time. Three years from November of 99 to November of 2002. When, by that time, I had spent so much time and energy and effort trying to resuscitate it, I had gone horribly into debt, about $50,000, and I was going to have to go bankrupt. So my girlfriend at the time says, this is killing you. This is killing you. You have got to stop this. You have got to just give it up. So I <clears throat> sent out the word that I was, you know, I just couldn't go anymore. Uh, I had done my best, but somebody else was going to have to take over and, and go from here. And then, and then, next slide, Miss Belinda McKenzie of <laughs> 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 the Raises the dead. <laughs> raises the dead. She contacted me, first contact, what do you need? I don't know what I need. I haven't even given it any thought for so long. Find out what you need and let me know. And so we did, and we found out, and we, we told her. And a few, Well, she did her due diligence. It took a few weeks, but finally a check arrived, and we were back in business. So Belinda is one of the key and major players in this whole thing. Without her, I wouldn't be here today, and that's the truth. So again. <laughs> We love you. All right, next slide. Now, so what she paid for was a real DNA test <laughs> from real geneticists who were capable of doing recovering ancient DNA. Now, what do I mean by ancient DNA? Older than 50 years. That lab in, in uh, Vancouver, they only dealt with fresh DNA. They couldn't deal with, with very old DNA, much less 900 years old over 50 years, there's a huge amount of degradation and there's a huge amount of contamination from the bacteria of death that we were talking about. 
right? So this is not an easy thing to do. But these guys could do it because they had worked on the Kennewick Man. Everybody, oh, anybody yeah. heard of the Kennewick Man? The Kennewick Man. Yeah. This was a skeleton that was found in Washington State on Indian territory, and it looked clearly like a normal European. And the, the Indians went bazookas because they had these gambling concessions in the states, mm -hmm. because they get they get all these special privileges because they're supposedly the first people to settle America, mm -hmm. and so they work really really hard. Anytime something comes up to indicate that somebody was there before they were there, and this the Kennewick man was like nine thousand years old and looked like a European, so that wasn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. So they made the Clinton administration cement the whole thing over, and the Kennewick man. And, and it became this big legal case, and they eventually, it took like six years to be able to study it. Well, these guys studied it, and what they found was that the Kennewick Man was exposed on a riverbank. That's how it was found, and the water would wash in and cover it, and then it would, water would go out, and the sun would bake it, and so it was absolutely sterile. There wasn't any nuclear DNA. There wasn't any uh, mitochondrial DNA. It was just nothing to recover from. It. So at that time, later they were able, as, as the refinements got better, they were able to tell its date and stuff like that. But at the time, that's where they were. But these guys did great, a great job, and here's what they did. Next slide. Using, again, primers. Keep in mind, 20 to 30 base pairs long. 20 to 30 base pairs long, short length base, base pairs. They recovered the human's mitochondrial DNA, and she was from haplogroup A, and they found uh, uh, mitochondrial DNA for the star child from haplogroup C. And that's what that means. Mm -hmm. They also found, next slide, that in six attempts at finding the nuclear DNA, they couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. They were 10 times, 100 times better than the lab in Canada, and they couldn't do it in six attempts. Mm -hmm. They could not find nuclear DNA. So that proved right here that what they had said in 99 from Vancouver was wrong, just mm -hmm. was wrong. <coughs> Should have been thrown out right there. Again, you can still read on the internet that, that the 99 test was better than this test. And this test has turned out to be wrong because those primers are so short, 20, 30 base pairs long, and in 3 billion base pairs, it's not too hard to find pieces 20, 30 long that, that match up. But when you get out to 2 and 3 and 400 and 500 long, it's a different story, as we'll see with the new geneticists. Next slide. So, but, but out of trace genetics, those two guys, the result was that the star child skull was a human alien hybrid, and some of you might remember who have been here when I talked about it as a human alien hybrid. You might have seen that very same slide. We believe that up from 20 from their test in 203 right up until 210. We believed that was the result. Next slide. Um, it was what the guys told me in 203. I said, "Well, what can we do now?" And they said, "Well, you're going to have to wait if you can believe this three to five years." for this new technology to come on board that instead of primers, it's going to do it base pair by base pair by base pair. And that's what you need because you, if your thing has never been seen before, it, it, the base pairs are how it has to come out. You have to be able to pull it out base pair by base pair. Sure enough, almost three, three years to the month, that was July 2003, this is July 2006, a company called 454 Life Science announces that they have a technique for doing it. I'm not going to go into it. It doesn't matter. It's impossible. It's incredible. It's unbelievable how they do it. But they do it. They can pull it out. They can disassemble uh, DNA base pair by base pair. It's just simply astounding. And then, and then tell you what you have. Next slide. So, what, in early 210, a new geneticist contacted me and offered to help using that new kind of equipment. From 206, the first few of these things that were done, the first few uh, genomes that were recovered were like $10, $15 million each. <laughs> the price just was plummeting that whole time. So now it's down to maybe to do ancient DNA, it's, it's just a couple million. Now, a lot of people say, well, wait a minute, why does it cost so much to do the star child DNA when I read on the Internet that I could, you know, you can have your DNA done for $10,000, $5,000, $10,000. Well, that's true. You can have your DNA, your, your genome sequence for about 10 grand right now using this equipment right. because it's fresh DNA. You saw the rubber band pile, mm -hmm. you know. All these things do is they unbuckle the rubber bands and just, and just string them out and measure them. Fresh DNA, easy to do. Now, imagine when you're dead for a long time, imagine that wad of rubber bands put through a wood chipper mm -hmm. and all the little pieces. And that's what you've got to put together 
to make the genome of something that's been dead for a long time. And that's our problem. You, to do that, you have to do it again and again and again and again, 50 to 100 times. Run it through the machines 50 to 100 times so that you fill in every gap and you string the rubber bands back together. Basically, yeah. So that's why it costs so much. Next slide. Anyway, when he did, after a few weeks, he recovered and sequenced dozens of fragments of the nuclear DNA. That's all he got the first, the first time. Dozens of fragments, but they were long. And, but they all came out of the junk. But they were in the hundreds. And so what he did was when he got those dozens, he sent them all to what's called the NIH database. Next slide. The NIH is the National Institutes of Health in, in uh, Maryland. And what they have is, in, in America, they put out the money to most labs to do DNA work. So that if you want to do uh, some kind of work, they will give you the grant money to do it. And in doing so, you owe them the results. And they take the results and they put them in the database. So by the time, by 210, when we were doing this, middle 210, the database was very, very full of literally billions of, of coherent base pair strings to compare to. All of the human, all the chimp, all the gorilla, and, and, and parts of, of hundreds of other animals. So it had a very, very good spread, I mean, down to bacteria, and, and, and yeast, and molds, and things like that. Everything anybody did, it went into that database, and it was there. So if you had unusual DNA, that's what you did. You sent it there to see if it matched up with anything. Next slide. So what the star child did was some of it did come back in strings that matched up in the human genome. Some of it did. This is one of 265 base pairs. Okay? And, and it says very clearly that that 265 base pairs is found exactly matched in Homo sapiens chromosome 1 genomic content here. They know where it is, right? But half of the things he sent in, next slide, half of them came back. This is a 342 base pair. No significant similarity found. Not on Earth. So he contacted me and he says, boy, you really got something here. He says, we can have a few of these, maybe, but not half of them. He says, you've got something here. Let's go to work on it. And I told him, we don't have a pot to piss in. I'm sorry. But we just, we can't get the kind of money you need. And he says, let me think about it. And that's when that plan of keeping the little pieces came up. Mm -hmm. To do it, you know, to do it more seriously. So he began to do, he did another one. Next slide. Oh, excuse me, this is the next test he did. Just to, he was so excited, he did this test. And this is really cool, I think. Spectrophotometer illustrates light wave absorbance in pure DNA. This is how it looks, human DNA this curve right here. This is how no DNA looks, and this is how protein contamination looks. And they all know how this goes. And so he just wanted to see how it would look. Next slide. And what you see is the human looks very much like it's supposed to look, but the star child looks like kind of a drunk snake, doesn't it? <laughs> just what is it? It's not really no DNA. It's not protein contamination. It's not human. What is it? And this too, he said, this, this tells you it's this is very unusual what you have here. I don't know what it is, but this is not normal. Very cool. Next slide. So now let's go back and get back on track because we're going to start talking about mitochondrial DNA now. All right? So you've got to get back where we were. Remember, three billion base pairs in the nuclear DNA and 16,569 base pairs in the mitochondria. But that's where 95% of it works. That's where you don't get much change over time. And only females pass it on, et cetera. Next slide. So he recovered, in one of his next attempts, he recovered four fragments, four, from mitochondrial DNA. Four. And, it, and, and the problem is, if it comes in junk, you can't figure anything out. You can't compare. You can't do anything. You've got to get it from the working parts to be able to compare it head up to what the human parts do. So, mitochondrial DNA is circular in design, and it is, and maintains astonishing frequency, efficiency, only about 5% is junk, which is more like 3%, that does nothing critically important to its functioning. 15 primary genes are very well understood. This is one of the best understood parts of your body. Uh, each one of those, the RNAs, the, the NDAs, all that's very well understood. 
and code for RNA. <clears throat> Mitochondrial DNA is extremely highly conserved. It undergoes so little change over time, those changes are used as, a, as the biological clock. You've heard about mitochondrial Eve. You, they take human females and they <coughs> clock back their mitochondrial DNA, and the oldest DNA is found in black Africans of South Africa, just where Sitchin said the Anunnaki said they created mm. this. That's where you find them genetically. And they're about 200,000 years old. That clock takes us back about 200,000 years to those black African women. Us sitting here, 60, 70, 80, uh, um, you know, differences, those have 120. Those, the oldest of us have 120. We'll get to that. Next slide. All right. Human haplogroups, this, they're like 30, maybe you can sometimes get 33, 37, 38. People argue about the haplogroups, but these are the haplogroups right here. HBTA, remember the haplogroup A for the human, haplogroup C for the star child, two basic ones, and we don't even know that that's their haplogroups, and these are the rest of the haplogroups. And here you see the human mitochondrial DNA from the Cambridge reference sequence. To get like the standard baseline, they picked one person and they did their mitochondrial DNA, and that became the baseline against which everything else was measured. Cambridge reference sequence, it was done at Cambridge. And then you have the Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA, and you have two of Denisova, the Denisova bone and the Denisova molar. Well, what is Denisova? Next slide. Surprise! <laughs> Denisovans are a new addition to the early homo prehuman family tree, if you haven't heard about them. They just got this, this uh, finger bone and the tooth out of a cave, and they thought it, it was with Neanderthals, and they thought it was Neanderthal, but they measured its mitochondrial DNA, and its mitochondrial DNA was so different that they knew it had to be, even though they only had a little piece of finger bone and a tooth, it had to be another species. Just because mitochondrial DNA is so well conserved, and everything fits within a, such a tight window of each species, that if you're outside that window, you're something else. Mm -hmm. This is very significant. So Denisovans were discovered in 210. They seem to have been contemporaries of Neanderthals. Their DNA exists up to the 5% level in modern Micronesians, Fijians, New, Gu New Guineans, and Australian Aborigines, and new groups being discovered. This is very exciting in the world of, of anthropology. Mm -hmm. Next slide. And, and biology and genetics. Now, base pair nucleotides, get with this. 1,255 of 16,000. Let's say we had all 16,000 stretched out here one by one. We're going to take out this narrow slice from 1,255 to 1,350. These 95 contain no variations in any haplogroup. They're clean. There are no changes. When we talk about highly conserved, that's what we mean. No changes over time in, in, in none of them. Very highly conserved across all 33 haplogroups, the one Neanderthal and the two Denisovans. Next slide. Thanks. Now we're going to take another stretch. Oh, I want to show you what variation looks like. Variation in human mitochondrial DNA. This, these, these lines come up. The computers do this automatically. But you see where everything else has a T, there's a C right here in this haplogroup. That's a variation. That is a variation. Keep that in mind. You can have them. They do have them. And over the whole course of the 16,000, humans have 120. Like that. Next slide. Okay, this is the other way they can be. They can be a change or they can be a missing. If there's a missing um, nucleotide, the computer automatically puts, puts something in to show there's, there's something different here. So you can either have a complete change or you can have just a missing spot, up or down. See, up or down, up, down. Next slide. The computers know. Now here we have a different stretch. We have from 1426, well, excuse me, from 1262 to 1426. This is, a, instead of 95 like the other one, this is 164 base pairs long. Now in this one, we find that there, each of the Denisovans, each of the Denisovans have one difference. You see it right there? The Neanderthal has one right here, that C right there. And the human has one right here, that C right here. Each of them have one. This is a very highly conserved area, but there is one change for everybody. Now we're going to see the star child's exact same segment right here. Next slide. 17 changes. 
17 years. <coughs> you with me? Mm -hmm. Now right here, folks, this is a home run. Just right here. To show that it's not human, it's not Neanderthal, it's not Denisovan. It is something else. And, and Vivi came up with this great analogy that I'm going to, I'm going to use and going to share with you. It's as if the human, the Denisovans, and the Neanderthals, or at least in the States, this is how I know it. Let's say humans have an area code on their phone in Louisiana. Neanderthals have an area code in Tennessee. Denisovans have an area code in Pennsylvania. The Star Child's area code is on the moon! <laughs> on the moon! It's that far away. You with me? Mm -hmm. It's that big a difference. <coughs> now, we're going to see it in more detail, but, but this just shows you right here. Mm -hmm. It's very, very dramatic. Next slide. In the mitochondrial DNA of all humans, a maximum of 120 variations. Again, a maximum. We have less. All of us in this room are found in the oldest human type, Southern Africans. The rest of us have fewer. Neanderthals differ from the human CRS by 200, plus or minus variations. And these ones by 385. Remember I said they have to call this a new species because it's so far away from 200. Yeah. It's 185 away when we're only 80 away from Neanderthal and, and it's different. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, they are more different from these than we are different from them. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Now, chimps are out to 1,500. Mm -hmm. 1,500. What do you think the star child is? <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> yeah, you can't even imagine. Four fragments of star child mitochondrial DNA add up to 1,583 base pairs. 1,583 is 9.5% 9 of the 16,569 base pairs in the human mitochondrial DNA. In the star child's 1,583 base pairs, there are 93 variations, almost to the 120 maximum in just the four fragments. 9.5% <coughs> times 93 equals 883.5 if you blow it out to 100%, if you extrapolate it out in the star child's mitochondrial DNA. The star child mitochondrial DNA will be 700% different, 700% different from human. This is the slide is screwed up, as you can see. But here it is, between 800 and 1,000. Between 800 and 1,000 as opposed to that. Mm -hmm. Area code on the moon. Mm -hmm. Very, very different. And established, four fragments, 9.5%. With the, with the mitochondria, with the you know, nuclear DNA, when it's 3 billion, all those fragments that he figured up, it's like 50 million, it's still peanuts. It's just a small portion. That's not a small portion. This, this is significant, very significant. Next slide. Now we're going to move to the, the big kahuna, all right? He was looking, looking, looking for something out of that 3% that worked, not mitochondrial DNA, but nuclear DNA. He started calling it the golden needle. I've got to find the golden needle in the haystack. Uh, one of these, it's called shotgunning what he does. He just shotguns it out, and it can hit anywhere. It's like a shotgun blast. You just never know what you're going to get. It's a shotgun. So he says, I've got to find the golden needle in the haystack. I've got to find a piece that comes out of the 3% that works, so it will tell me something about how the star child works versus how the, the, uh, the, the human works. So he calls me up and he says, man, guess what? I didn't find a golden needle. I found a diamond needle. <laughs> you won't believe this. And this is what it is. In every human embryo, a gene called forkhead box P2 or Fox P2 is a master gene controlling embryonic growth in at least 300 other crucial genes. And some people argue it can be as many as 1,000. So this one single gene, Fox P2, controls the effect, has a downward flow on at least 300 and maybe we don't know how many. Mm -hmm. They're still trying to figure it out. But it controls motor skills, brain we know for sure, brain development, lung development, speech, nerve communication. It's like your center core and it's controlling all of that. So what do you suppose happens if there's some kind of a difference or a variation or a mutation in a FOXP2 gene when you're an embryo? You are screwed, glued, and tattooed. You are done for. You are going to miscarry. Mm -hmm. As a rule, mm -hmm. one change. One. It's one of the most highly conserved genes in our bodies. Why? Because it can't afford mistakes. It just can't afford mistakes. Now, there are mistakes. There, there is one 
change that can be made, and you will be born, and you will live, and you will never speak. That's how they, they found out that it was speech-related. So you can have one, but if you do, and you're born, as I said, you are screwed, blue, and tattooed. You are not in good shape. You need absolutely everything to go right in your Fox P2. All of us sitting in this room, our Fox P2s are the same, exactly. Every base pair in yours and yours and yours is exactly the same as every base pair in mine. Are we not standing here being who we are? Mm -hmm. Fox P2, highly, highly conserved. No change, understand. Next slide. Now, in the Fox P2 gene has 2,594 base pairs. It is one of the most highly conserved genes in our bodies. Changes almost never happen. Each one of those 25 in normal humans is exactly the same. What I just said. Next slide. This is Fox P2, what it looks like. A 211 base pair fragment. He recovered a 211 base pair fragment of the star child's Fox P2, the diamond needle. This is it. A Fox P2 is compared to the exact same 211 base pairs in human Fox P2 in blue, <coughs> this one, and in other species of animals. Uh, rhesus monkey, mouse, dog, elephant, possum, chicken, frog, and zebrafish. Right on down. Okay, and you see, and Exxon, this is it. This is an absolutely head-to-head -head comparison. Remember I said he had to be able to make a head-to-head -head comparison? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right here. Well, what does this tell us? Next slide. What it tells us, uh, this is too bad. Storch House 211 base pair fragment is 56 variations. There's your rhesus monkey. There's no variations in, in, in humans and in, 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 uh, Neanderthals and Denisovans. It's all the same. In a rhesus monkey, you're up to 2, 20 for the mouse, 27 for the dog, 21 for the elephant, 21 for the possum, 26 for the frog, 56 for the star child. Mm. Really, really amazing. So the 211 is 8%. It's almost like the 9.5% of the other. It is significant. Of the base pair total in the Fox B2 gene, extrapolate 8% out to 100, you get 12.5. 12.5 times 56 is 700 plus or minus star child DNA variations. 700 where one is the maximum. You with me? This is what the, next slide, this is what the geneticist, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot, I forgot. this is the newest one, the newest one, I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, the newest one is he found a collagen-like protein fragment identified by a collagen pattern search. A human fragment sequence is shown in blue the collagen characteristics pattern of glycine is pink. Note the amount of proline in association with the glycine. It has a special meaning. You see glycine, proline, proline, glycine, proline, glycine, proline. Mm -hmm. You see it like that all together? Guess what pull, pulls up for this? Next slide. The glycine proline pattern in the previous fragment resembles the pattern found in collagen 8, a protein found largely in the corneal endothelium of human eyes. Now, let me explain how this works. Collagen makes up 25 to 35 percent of our bodies. It's most of, a lot of our bones and all that. Collagen, 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 it makes up a lot of things. So there's a lot of different kinds of collagen. Mm. Collagen 8 is this very exotic kind that makes this lining of the inside of the eye that faces into the, um, yeah, to the lens from the cornea. Very, very specific collagen, and that's what he finds from the star child. Now, it's very, very different from the human because the star child has a very, very different eye. Another piece of the puzzle mm -hmm. that's just completely different. So next slide. This is, this is where, oh, it's too bad you're going to miss some of that. The comment from our geneticist in his recently com composed abstract. Now, he wrote an abstract. It's on the Star Child website. You can try to read it, but I assure you, you won't get very far in it because it's written in that, that language, that science language. But this is where the geneticist from Stanford contacted me. He said, I read the abstract, and I'm very impressed, and I want to, I want to meet with you about it. So this is what he says. The probability that such a highly specific arrangement of changes in a small fragment could have occurred by accumulation of sequencing errors is extremely low, if not close to zero. Nor could this arrangement have occurred due to contamination with the DNA of any known species. From this evidence, one may conclude the underlying biochemistry of the entity's life form must be either the same as 
are highly similar to humans or other species, yet the use of the genetic code, which still, it, and basically it says, it's sort of the same, but is clearly very different. And again, this is more on level of what I've been showing you here. Anybody can see this. Mm -hmm. Next slide. So, what, where are we going with this? <laughs> In the 1500s, these men moved the earth from the center of the universe to its proper position. Mm -hmm. This was a profound experience for everybody alive at the time. The earth is not it. Mm -hmm. The earth operates, you know, circles around the sun, and everybody had to adjust to that. It was shocking. Next slide. The Wright brothers in, in 203, they moved us all into our future where our, uh, our planet gained a convenient scale. They, they shrunk the planet for us. They gave us a different world. Next slide. The star child is going to do, oh, excuse me, Neil Armstrong took the first step for all of us toward our inevitable future in space, and it just died. Boy, that better be an important call, because this is right at the end. <laughs> okay, anyway, um, so this, too, was a big, big step in human history. Next slide. And, and the star child skull is poised to transform humans into members of a galactic community, mm. to prove that we are members of a galactic community. And, coincidentally, next slide, maybe the star child heralds a new beginning that we have all heard 2012 might bring. This could be it. Mm -hmm. This could be it. The new future, the new whatever. Instead of all what they're saying, mm -hmm. maybe this is it. Mm -hmm. We still have time to be it mm -hmm. if we get our funding, mm -hmm. which could happen. Never know. Next slide. So, how do we get from here to there? How do we move the star child from being a partial proof of one of the greatest discoveries in all of human history to acceptance by mainstream science for what it so obviously is? How do we do that? We follow, next slide, we follow my friend Bob Rue's philosophy of life. Now, you all remember Hurricane Katrina. Here's Bob with, don't try. This is to the, to the looters. Don't try. I'm sleeping inside with a big dog, an ugly woman, two shotguns, and a claw hammer. <laughs> <laughs> this is his oriental rug shop he's one of the guys that didn't leave he stayed to protect what was there from the looters and the water I might add you see where he's standing about two feet from there is where the water rose to its high part, point but he knew that was going to happen because what people don't know and it's always a nice little anecdote to throw in is that everybody wonders why in the world would New Orleans build a city in a bowl mm. why would that happen well, what really happened was back way in the 1700s when they were first settling the area, the Mississippi River would flood out to 100 miles on each side, and that's where, how the delta was created, right? So the French and the Spaniards and the people like that who would do this kind of stuff, they knew that they had to wait to the highest point of the flood, sail down the river, and find any land that was up and was suitable to build a city, because that would never flood. And there was this big crescent of land in one of the bows of the Mississippi River, and, and it was the biggest one there was, and on that crescent, they formed the city of New Orleans. And it, sure enough, it never did flood. That part is still the garden district of today, if you've ever been there, the, 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 the rich part of town. But as the city grew bigger and spread out, it spread out into the floodplain, mm -hmm. and that's what happened. And then they began to build the skyscrapers there, and it sank it down, and now it's in a 17-foot bowl. Mm -hmm as the, the soft land went down. You can't tell it just standing there. You just feel everything flat because it's like this. But Bob knew his shop was on the old, that everybody knows where the old line is. And he said, it's going to come close, but I don't think it's going to, because it, Oriental rugs, I mean, Oriental rugs, they're ruined if they get, you know, if they get uh, flood water. And they're ruined if they get stolen. And he wasn't going to let that happen. So he stayed and he stuck it out. Don't try. This, this sign, by the way, became famous. It was in over 800 newspapers around the world. He became like a symbol of defiance of the looters and you know people sticking it out and all this. And that sign is now in a museum in New Orleans, and if you go, you might be able to see it. He was offered ten thousand dollars for it by uh, <laughs> one of the one of the main um, uh, newspaper people that were there. Um, I'm trying to think of his name, but anyway, what Bob did. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just rambling, but it's it's a fun story. He and his wife, he looks like a complete slob, and he is. He's a bum. He and I were roommates in the French Quarter when we were young. Did some damage to the girls. I won't deny it. But nonetheless, we, this is a cool guy. He doesn't look at it anymore. I don't look at it anymore. But we were neat in our day. He is, looks like a slob, but he lives in one of the garden, the garden district mansions. 
his wife is, is fairly wealthy and he does okay here. But this is just how he's, it's like he says, he's a fisherman, he's a Greek fisherman's son. He says, I'm going I'm to be a Greek fisherman's son until the day I die. So he stayed and everybody that saw this knew he was there and they started calling him. And they were saying, Bob, go to my house, the key is under this. And go in and, and make sure everything is okay, protect us from the looters, and you can have anything in the freezer because it's just gonna go, it's just gonna go bad and, and eat anything in the food we have and everything. What they didn't say is you can raid the wine cellars too, but yeah. that. So <laughs> so what he became, he became party central for all the newspaper and, and media people, the, the television people that came to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And needed a, a you know needed foods and stuff. He's a good cook, cooks good gumbo, good jambalaya, the whole. So he, he what you do, what gumbos and jambalayas are, they're just a bunch of things thrown together and thrown together well. So what Bob would do is he would make these big urns full of food, and everybody knew that at his place there was going to be a party that night and meals, and that went on for like three weeks, you know, every night, and and. So everybody knew who he was, still do, still come and say hi to him and stuff like that. And that's making the best of a really bad situation. So next slide. What we have to do is just go stick with it for as long as it takes to make things go the way they should, the way that is right and true and good. So how long will it take for the star child until we find someone with enough money, curiosity, and courage to join us in making it happen? When we find that person, every human's life will change in ways we can't really imagine right now, but I'm confident, no, I'm certain, that the, those changes will be right and true and good. Mm -hmm. Next slide. And, and for any of you that want to know more, this is the intervention in the, the e-books that you can get, but I'm not really trying to sell you anything. This is just going to be part of the slideshow. <laughs> but that's it. So you can clap now. No. This is really going to be big, big history. And all that we do with this is part of that history. Mm -hmm. Belinda's part of it. Viv's going to be part of it. Others are part of it. But it's weird to live your life knowing that everything you're doing is under a microscope in the future. Mm -hmm. And everybody's going to look back and try to figure out why you did this, why you did that, what you did right, what you did wrong. It's a weird, weird feeling to live that way when you know it as we know it. But nonetheless, that's what's going to happen. And this is going to be, I mean, even if, even if a UFO lands on the White House lawn, this is still going to be a big story. If you have any questions now as a you know, Q&A, any questions at all, go ahead. And it's just a question about the teeth. Right. Um, how many did they have compared to normal human? And you said they didn't have tongues, they didn't have tongues as well. So what You can't mean? tell because of the broken off rear part. Right. You can't tell. Uh, it, it looks like they're missing the eye teeth. It looks like that, based. It looks, so it's going to be a much smaller mouth. There's not enough room in there for 32 teeth. So if you have any questions now as a you know, Q&A, any questions at all, go ahead. And it's just a question about the teeth. Right. Um, how many did they have compared to normal human? And you said they didn't have tongues. They didn't have tongues as well. So what you can't mean? tell because of the broken off rear part. Right. You can't tell. Uh, it, it looks like they're missing the eye teeth. It looks like that, based. So it's going to be a much smaller mouth. There's not enough room in there for 32 teeth. So how could they, would they have eaten normal food? Yes, they, they, they did eat normal food because you can tell from the chipping on the teeth. But also there's a, there was an isotope test done that showed that it had isotopes in its body, in, 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 it, in its body that indicated that it, it had the same kind of isotopes as the female, meaning that it had lived for some time in that area. Whatever that no is. No idea of the age at all. Right? No idea how long it was there because the isotopes work into the body pretty quick. It could have been a year, it could have been two years, it could have been five years. We don't know. <clears throat> My assumption basically is it probably was a crashed alien that couldn't get away and he somehow developed, it somehow developed, whether male or female, we don't know, some kind of relationship with this woman because when it died, we thought for a long time that it was, it was a. There are these stories among Native Americans. Uh, a woman named Paula Gunn Allen contacted me very early into this, and she said, do you know about the legends of the Star Children? And I said, no. She says, well, in all, just about all of the Native American cultures in America, and some down into South America, 
there are these legends of the star people and the star children. People come out of the stars down to the village, their village, and they pick a woman who is barren, who has no children, nearly always a barren woman, and they will tell the village, this woman is now going to have a child, mm -hmm. and it's going to be something we've created, and we are going to come back and pick it up in five or six or seven or eight years. Like fairy tales. It doesn't matter, but we're coming to pick it up, and when we come, it better be here. Mm -hmm. The whole village is taxed with raising this thing up, mm -hmm. right? So our thought was it must have died before they came. Well, this is when we still thought it was a child and all that. It must have died before they came, and she was so terrified of costing her whole village their lives. Or she could have been protecting it, like just meant it accidentally. But it died, it whatever, later. whatever it died. So she lugged it into a, what the girl said it was a mine tunnel, way away from the village where they were. But he knows that was that, that was the village nine hundred years ago. But it doesn't matter. Wherever it was, she got into that mine tunnel, and when she went in, this is again, all, we only can go on the hearsay evidence that, that she provided when she was you know, dying and she was just telling a story and had no idea that all of these details would be important in the future. But the way she describes it, the store child was dead. She lugged it up into that mine tunnel for whatever reason. She laid it down. She covered it over. She buried it with the dirt, but she left the hand out. And then she laid down beside it, and she wrapped the hand around to, to indicate their closeness in life, and she committed suicide. Mm -hmm. There's no other way you get that scene. We don't know how she did it, took poison, cut her ribs, what, whatever, we don't know. But that has to be what happened. For that scene to be created, star child died, woman buries it, commits suicide, that's it. So the idea of protecting the village is kind of what we, we got in our heads as the most logical explanation for it. But that, that doesn't mean that's what happened. They could have been, maybe they were, I mean, it was a lover's thing, it was a male and a female, and maybe they had some way of getting it on, I don't know. But that is still a close bond, no matter what, when you go to that effort to bury something and then you stick the hand out and you kill yourself. You are making a sincere statement of commitment to that person. And so that's that's why we, we came away with it. Thank you. Okay, sure. Any others? The, the fibers in the skull, is there any connection with Morgellons disease? We've talked about that many times, and there's a big piece about it on the, uh, on the website. No, because those are microscopic in size, whereas Morgellon fibers tend to be visible. These are highly, highly invisible. Those are multiplied by many times, so you can see them. They would be like frog hairs or more, certainly not like Morgellons. And Morgellons tends to be a disorder of the tissue, whereas this is buried into the matrix of the bone and is formed there. So it doesn't make sense. Yes? Um, you mentioned isotopes. Yeah. Um, <coughs> the three isotopes of oxygen, and when that allows the moon rock, that they concluded that it must have come from the Earth or somewhere like Earth because the oxygen isotopes were, were similar enough. The, 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 uh, I can't remember what they are. Yeah, but there are other things that are different yeah, too. Yeah, 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 but yeah. I'm just I'm just making the point that the ratio of those three oxygen isotopes was, was regarded as a fairly strong piece of evidence. So I'll take your point. Well, in the in the in the isotopic analysis, there's a pretty big difference between in the carbon. But the guy that did it said it could be that we just had trouble pulling out the inorganic carbon. We don't know. They, they really couldn't tell, but there was a pretty big jump in the difference between the carbon. But everything else looked enough. He says, I'm satisfied that this thing lived in that area for some time to have eaten the food of that area. Uh, no fish. It was just not a fish. It didn't have enough uh, whatever you have to have to have fish. He says, very low fish amount, if any, and obviously living in the middle of the desert like that, you're not going to be getting fish 900 years ago. It's going to, you're going to be eating things other than that. Made sense. You know, whatever, whatever came out of that, that test did make sense. Did you think, I've got 40 years that, um, oh, that, that it was a, a kind of idea that the star child might have been. Is that still the case? Do you still no, think the, it's the female, like the female was about Oh, right, years old. okay. We, we have no inkling yeah, okay. on it. Yeah. Because of the durability of the bone, sure. because mm -hmm. of the cycling of the teeth, you know, right. we have no idea. Could that thing could have lived for five hundred years, a thousand sure. years? We mm -hmm. don't. We really they have no way of knowing, and we don't know, have no way of knowing what it was, how old it was when it died. Mm -hmm. But she 
based on standard human wear of teeth patterns, she was between 30 and 40. Yeah. It was quite interesting too, isn't it, that the um, haplogroups A and C, they're not geographically that, that linked, are they? I mean, isn't one one area and one another, or is that, have I got that wrong? No, they're pretty common. Oh, they're, they're two of the most common. Yeah. Two of the most common. <laughs> common but, but the haplogroups we're no longer sure of, yeah, because okay. again, those were recovered with the with the shorter uh, oh, right, okay. um, um, beta, yep. uh, primers, mm. and so now the haplogroup we don't have a haplogroup for it yet now oh, okay. with the new larger stuff yeah. because the mitochondrial you have to get the, mm. the whole of it now. We we only have four fragments. Yeah, yeah. We have to get the whole of it mm. to be able to lay it all out against the other haplogroups. Mm. Okay. Well, that's interesting in itself, isn't it? I mean. As, as a well, it, it, yeah. you know, it'll be it'll be either on that list or it'll make a new one, just yeah. like the Denise yeah. of it did and, and whatever. It, well, excuse me, what am I saying? It'll be a new one yeah, because right. it's going to be 700 yeah. or to eight, I mean, 800 or more. So it'll just be a new yeah. if you're going to call it a human. But the whole point mm -hmm. is it isn't going to be a human, so it isn't going to be a haplogroup mm -hmm. of humans because it's it's going to be so. See, the haplogroups are all 120 or below. 120 or below. Mm -hmm. Star Child's 800 and, between 800 and 1,000. It, it's just, you know, very code moon. It's just going to be completely different. So I don't see how it's going to what, fit what on your, What's your geneticist's uh, feelings about this? Is he just says, get the money. Please get the money. <laughs> <laughs> just ready to go. I mean, yeah. they all know, everybody, the executives at the lab know. Now this, this other guy we're going to talk to, it's the word's going to spread. I'm here to spread the word. That's why you have these guys, you know, filming this. I'm, I'm, and, and wherever I go, anybody wants to film it to be able to film it. I'm not here to really make money, just enough to survive. I don't. I don't. I, it's all I ever make is just enough to kind of survive, because I know that in the end, it's going to pay off in a very big way. Yeah. And I, I, I said, have you tried the normal British fundraising, so science fundraising, things like the um, Labour Home Trust or? British Association, Advancement of Science. No, they, 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 they give out funding. Yeah, uh, we, have, we have lots of those in the States. And he's considering that. That's what the abstract was for. And I'll tell you a little story about it. So he wrote the abstract because in order to submit a, a proposal for a grant for that kind of money, all right, what you have to do is you have to make your proposal and you have to send it to other geneticists and you have to have at least three well-qualified geneticists in the field in question to write a, a recommendation that the grant even be considered or it won't be considered, right? So he carefully chose five people to send that uh, proposal to, to get hopefully get three that would be willing to sign it. The two oldest ones agreed to do it. The three youngest ones essentially wrote back, what in the hell are you doing? And what Have you lost your mind? Are you crazy? Get away from this. This will kill your career. What are you, nuts? Mm -hmm. Wrote him really scathing letters. Wow. Yeah, it upset him. So he said, while you're over there, see if you can find somebody maybe over there. That was his top five over, and he has two lined up, but we need that third one. And then this guy from Stanford out of the blue. You know, so that... I'm going to meet with that guy pretty soon, and that that may be our third guy. Do you know how much you actually need? To yes, we know exactly how much we need. We need three million dollars to do the full recovery of the genome, the three billion base pairs, to put the the rubber bands back together after they've been through the wood chipper. We need three million dollars to do that, and where that three million dollars is, again. All of the runs that have well, to be made. That give you a definite answer. Yeah, but but there's two parts to the to the Star Child situation. It isn't just recovering all three billion base pairs or however many it's going to be. The Star Child could have considerably less. It could have considerably more. Everything though of a primate nature seems to hover around three billion plus or minus. So we're thinking it's going to be in the range of three billion. It could not be. It could be more. It could be less. But what we do know is that a huge chunk of it, we don't know how much, but a huge chunk of it is going to be, as we've seen already from the NIH, never seen before. So there's going to be nothing to compare it to. Mm. And so that's when we're going to have to bring in specialists, and this is where it's going to cost a lot of money too. Guys are going to have to come in to look at those unknown parts and sequence them out 
the old-fashioned way, the way that we did the human genome the first time. Remember, it took 15 years. and do, You do it basically by hand. The machines are no good. You've got to basically put it all together by hand and figure out where and what goes where. It is, the way he described it was it's a, it's a multi-thousand piece puzzle sitting on the table and all the pieces are there, but you've got to play with them until you, you put it together to make sense. You can do it. It just takes its time consuming and it takes a lot of computing power and people who know what they're doing. So we have to hire those experts and do that. But in the end, we have a complete genome and all the unknown parts will be filled in and we'll be able to show there will be just no argument any critic can make. No argument anybody can, any the critic can make. The test thing, though, is, is there no danger of being ripped to pieces and hardly any left? I know these no, things, no. even pieces here. It's, a, it's amazing. It would just, you saw all those cuts and everything. 90% of that was done with the first testing that was done at that lab in Canada when they kept mm -hmm. screwing up and they had kept having to cut more and they yeah, cut yeah. chunks off that. Now, I said, I said, how much, how big a piece do you need? And he said, bring me something the size of your little fingernail. That'll work. That's <laughs> all they need. Because they have something called PCR. They get the original DNA, and they have a process called PCR that'll make a vat of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally a vat of it. Of the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it's really, so every time we make cuts now, it's just little tiny, little mm -hmm. tiny pieces. It's really amazing compared to what we had to cut in the beginning. So what, what do you think? So the three million plus for, for that initial. Okay, thing we need three million for the for the DNA mm -hmm. to do all that. Then we we want four million more to do two documentary films. Two million for one. Two million. We want a seven million dollar package. We could start with five million, but if you're going to get five million, why not go for it? So that you know you can do it all. But we want to make two documentary films because this process is about a two-year process to do everything that needs to be done. The mitochondrial DNA will come pretty quickly because it's only 16,000, you know. That'll mm -hmm. come three or four months and we'll have that done. The, the nuclear is going to take about a year to 18, mm -hmm. uh, to 18 months because you have not only the, the things that you have to put together, but then you have to figure it out, what I was telling you. So that's perfect for two films. First film about the mitochondrial DNA and the backstory, and the second film about the nuclear DNA and putting camera, um, camera and microphone in people's faces, some famous, some not. And what does alien reality mean to you? Because we'll have established alien reality with the mitochondrial DNA, right? So the first film establishes alien reality. And so the next film is showing the nuclear recovery and all that and just, just nailing it and then asking people, what do you think about it? And, and that's the second film. Those two films we expect to be two of the most successful documentaries ever made. So if you know anybody with money who might be interested in a good deal, we're looking not for a donation, but for investors. People who will invest the money and get a return. And they will get that $7 million over several times, if not many times. Several, if not many, because every country in the world is going to be interested in seeing this at either the theater level or the television level or the C, you know, DVD or, or whatever. It's just three big income streams from people getting access to this information, notwithstanding the fact that every, every college and lab and everything else is going to have to have a copy for students of the future and all that. So it's just going to be a big deal. Nobody, nobody's going to lose money on the deal. And yet, and yet, you will not believe this, I have talked to probably a dozen a dozen men who have net worth individually probably over a hundred million each mm -hmm. who could have done it with the stroke of a pen mm -hmm. bring the real skulls to them and I'm not kidding you bring the real skulls to them let them hold them let them see them let them see the copies go through just a conversation and showing them stuff like this where they leave that meeting convinced, and they say, well, boy, you know, this sounds really good. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really look into this and do all that. How do they look into it? They go ask some friend, or they go on the Internet and they read, read Wikipedia. And, and while I'm sitting there, I'm saying, now, don't go on the Internet and read Wikipedia or what Stephen Novella says or any of this other stuff. It's all lies meant to keep us down and to keep people from you, like you from giving us the benefit of the doubt. You tell them that, they go right home and they do it anyway. And somehow, in their minds, they believe Wikipedia over what, you know, it's the old thing about you come in and you, 
and you, the wife catches the guy in bed with another woman, and he jumps up and he says, are you going to believe me or your lying eyes? You know? <laughs> I didn't do anything. It's like that. Are you going to believe me or your lying eyes? And they believe Wikipedia. It's like that with a lot of things. It's incredible. I am just staggered each time that we walk out of there thinking we got it. We got it with these people. Mm. And then in a few days they say, we've thought it over and we're going to take a pass. And da -da, you know. It's crushing. It is just crushing. Yeah. So I want to try to work something up like this that's just overwhelming. And hopefully somebody that I speak to in the next month, or, or maybe if you know anybody that works at the papers, the scandal rags here, um, maybe they'll want to interview and do a story about it or something like that. But it's just raising the profile up enough mm -hmm. for somebody with money to understand that there's a real deal here waiting to be plucked mm -hmm. by somebody. A real, real deal. And, you yeah. know, it's just all I can do. It's all I've ever done, really, is just put it out there and hope for the lightning bolt to strike. And that's what I'm here looking for that lightning bolt. But what about Max Tyser and Stacey Herbert? They Who? run um, internet uh, fundraising efforts to, to collect large amounts, small amounts, or loads of Yeah, but we've talked to we talked to the uh, what was it the what's the one in the states that's what, uh, Kickstarter. Kickstarter. Yeah, Kickstarter. Yeah, we talked to the Kickstarter honchos and we explained to them what we had. You know, we needed seven million for this, and he says, "You're not going to get it. It's big, big, not for too that." Big. It's mm. too big and it's too controversial, mm. and he says you won't you won't get it. He says we don't advise it at all, mm. and I, they're all the same. You can't. It would take forever to get this. Mm. But I, I'll tell you something else. As you all sit here, you think, well, this is really exciting. This is really cool, isn't it? I have a newsletter <laughs> called Bites of Pie that you sign up to on my website, and I have forty five hundred people subscribed to it, and every time I put out a new version of it. I am lucky if 1,500 people open it, and that's the truth. I know, that's the truth. You can you can tell who opened what, and it and I it's if I hit 40 percent, that's a that's a good number. Most people just they're signed up but they don't even open it. That's the start the level of interest is not what you think it is. Mm -hmm. You think because you're into it now, you you have some understanding and you get hyped up and you think, wow, everybody should feel like I do about it, but they don't. They don't know about it. This thing is kept really corked up. I, I have a hard time getting the message out. I really do. And because it's such a complex message, I'm sorry, it, that makes it hard as well. You got you got to bring something to the table in order to to understand what this is. And a lot of people don't don't want to strain themselves mentally. So thank you very much. Thank you.